All right, this is John Kolo with GrowingYourGreens.com. Today we have another exciting episode for you, and it is actually coming at you from the Mother Earth News Fair here in Pennsylvania. And I just got here today. I'm only here for one day. If you guys saw the last episode, it's basically a tour of this place and some of my favorite booze and whatnot. But today I have a very special opportunity, like the first in a lifetime for me, literally, to interview something very special that you guys will want to hear from and incorporate some of his vast amounts of knowledge into what you guys are doing with your garden and with some of the food you are growing, right? So uh, for those of you guys that don't know, this is Sandor Katz. He's the author of several books, three books. He wrote two on fermentation and one of which I consider the Bible of uh, fermentation. I mean, he, it, it's like it's like literally an encyclopedia. <laughs> and if you want to know anything about fermentation, in my opinion, this guy wrote the book and it's in there. And I, I would encourage you guys uh, to get that book with the art of fermentation. Yeah, and if you guys are like me and you're so busy and you don't have time to read and you don't live in the you know here in the uh, northeast where you get snow in the winter and you're inside for months at a time, reading might be good. I'm out in the west and I garden year round. I actually have it on my iPhone. I put headphones on. I'm out of my garden gardening and listening to this man's words. So excellent way to do it. Audible.com. Cool. So uh, Sandra, I got a, I went to his class this morning. I want to say and I got out of it and I was like, oh my god, that was like he, he gives an amazing presentation. He just makes fermentation really easy and accessible to people so that you won't be scared of it, right? You shouldn't be scared of fermentation and especially after I interview him today, after you watch this episode today, you're gonna be like, I'm gonna do fermentation. It's no problem whatsoever and I don't even know if it's even possible. I guess you gotta do something really wrong to really mess up or something like that. So we're gonna find out more in this episode. So uh, Sandra, the first question I wanna ask for you is, how did you end up <clears throat> getting into fermentation in the first place? Uh, well, about uh, 24 years ago in 1993, um, I moved from New York City, which is my hometown, um, to rural Tennessee, and I got involved in keeping a garden. And, um, you know, really the first year that I was gardening, um, I mean, I was such a naive city kid that it turned, it was a surprise for me that all the cabbage in the garden was ready at the same time. Um, but once I saw that there was a bunch of cabbage ready, um, uh, I thought to myself, I'd better learn how to make sauerkraut because I know I love to eat sauerkraut and I knew that sauerkraut was regarded as a, a strategy for preserving a, a cabbage. So um, I literally looked in the joy of cooking and I learned how to make sauerkraut from the joy of cooking and that first batch of sauerkraut was so delicious and uh, so satisfying that uh, I started exploring fermentation more deeply. And it turns out that, um, you know, there's nothing we could possibly eat that could not be fermented in some way. Um, you know, for me, sauerkraut was my gateway into mm. fermentation. I think it's a perfect gateway into fermentation. There's no need for starter cultures because it's all on the vegetables. There's no need for special equipment. You can work with a jar that's already in your pantry somewhere. Um, um, you know, it's simple, it's safe to the degree that you might be projecting your anxiety about bacteria onto the process of fermentation. Um, according to the U.S. Department of Agriculture, there is no case history of um, uh, food poisoning or illness. This is this food is a strategy for safety as, as much as anything. Uh, it's easy. You can enjoy results relatively quickly, um, you know, or you can let it ferment for a long time. It's very versatile. Um, you know, I love sauerkraut. I've, sauerkraut has been a constant in my life for this past uh, quarter century, as I have also experimented with, you know, miso and sake and salami and cheese and yogurt and kefir fear and kombucha and um, uh, you know all the other incredible uh, kinds of fermented foods and beverages that there are in this world. Wow sauerkraut <coughs> is the gateway drug I mean ferment ferment <laughs> right <laughs> so Sandor um, the next question is what are some of the benefits besides just the food preparation uh, preservation you know to the sauerkraut you know some people say you're making the food actually healthier and you're creating vitamins and and whatnot is this true? Yeah sure so um I mean, I would say with, with sauerkraut and many other um, living fermented foods, fermented foods that are not uh, cooked or heat processed after the fermentation, uh, you know, the most profound benefit really is the bacteria themselves. Um, you know, we're, 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 you know, hearing about the microbiome and how important the bacteria uh, in our bodies are, you know, not only for digestion, but for immune function, for mental health 
for virtually every uh, um, um, you know aspect of our physiology and functioning. So when you eat sauerkraut or other living fermented foods, you're literally ingesting complex communities of bacteria. Um, you know that that essentially can help us to restore biodiversity in the gut, where it can improve our health in all kinds of different ways. Uh, you know, fermentation also preserves vitamin C, generates additional B vitamins and K vitamins, um, you know, pre-digest nutrients and makes them more easily available to us. There are lots of other nutritional benefits to fermentation, but I would say that the probiotics, the bacteria themselves, uh, really are the most profound benefit. Mm. And so one of the things I like to do is, you know, I don't can my food because that literally is, is like you're going at war with the food and the bacteria, you know, good and bad. You're going to kill and wipe out everything, right? I prefer to have a symbiosis or an alliance, create an alliance with my food and the bacteria and culture them. So do you want to talk about maybe your opinions on canning versus, you know, uh, fermentation for food pre preservation? Sure. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to be uh, against canning. I mean, I, I can tomatoes. I mean, canning is part of my repertoire of techniques that I use for, for, for preservation. But canning really represents the, um, the opposite of fermentation. So fermentation is all about cultivating bacteria. And because all the food that we eat is populated by these extremely broad and varied uh, uh, communities of bacteria, um, you know, what we're doing is creating a selective environment that encourages uh, some of the bacteria to flourish while discouraging other bacteria. Um, uh, whereas in canning, you're just trying to sterilize the food and kill all of the bacteria. So they're, they're just very different approaches. I mean, certainly, you know, in the United States, a lot of people ferment sauerkraut and then can it. You know, personally, I think that that's a bad idea because you're really destroying the, you know, um, the greatest benefit that, 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 that it has, which is the probiotics. Um, um, but I mean, I'm not against canning I mean I think different kinds of foods lend themselves to different kinds of uh, preservation techniques cool and so another thing that actually I found interesting in your talk that I actually haven't heard before is that it's really important to only ferment soil grown foods you want to talk about this and why it's important to grow uh, you know ferment soil grown foods um, in general? And sure. I mean, I mean, I don't think it's impossible to ferment hydroponic vegetables, but you would always want to have some soil-based vegetables in there as well, because where do you think the bacteria come from? I mean, all plants are believed to be host to lactic acid bacteria, so the bacteria that you need to ferment the vegetables is already on the vegetables, but where it's coming from is the soil. Um, and it seems like you know vegetables that have been grown in a water-based medium, um, you know, may very well lack the bacteria that are essential for the fermentation that we're doing. Wow. Yeah. I mean, and I, that's what I teach. I teach biologic organic gardening, so that you know I, I in actively encourage uh, you know adding in living bacteria, including you know uh, lactobacillus and others, into your soil to have a living system because they are part of nature. And, and I mean, ba bacteria is really what uh, you know, give the soil nutrients and what sort of enable the soil to be self-regenerating. And fertile. And, and fertile, exactly. And so, you know, compost is really a, a fermentation practice. You know, you're using bacteria to break down your food waste and your garden waste and maybe some manure. Um, um, and that's how soil regenerates. And, um, you know, plants are dependent on bacteria uh, and fungi for um, their ability to uptake nutrients from uh, uh, the soil. So, um, I mean, fermentation is a lot um, uh, bigger than food preservation. I mean, fermentation really sort of, you know, underlies the soil and, um, you, know, and you know, the whole idea of soil fertility and the regenerative nature of, of soil. Right, I mean, one of the parallels is like the regenerative nature of the soil and the bacteria and the fungi and how they all work to help digest nutrients and make them available for the plants, but then how also the bacteria, yeast, and all our probiotics in us help us digest our food. Do you want to maybe say a few words about that? Yeah, sure. I mean, um, you know, I'm mean, contrary to the indoctrination that, you know, all of us who grew up in the United States in the 20th century received that bacteria are our enemies and bacteria are so dangerous and bacteria need to be avoided or destroyed by any means necessary. We are learning that bacteria are utterly essential to our well-being. And, uh, you know, it's through the action of bacteria that we are able to 
break down nutrients that we eat and assimilate those nutrients, um, but it goes way beyond digestion. Um, our immune system is mostly the work of bacteria in our intestines. Over the last five years, there's been all this incredible research that has revealed for the first time that um, you know, the production of serotonin and other chemical compounds that determine you know, how we think and how we feel are regulated by bacteria in, in our intestines in ways we don't fully understand. But it turns out that almost every aspect of our physiology and functionality is related to these uh, uh, bacteria that are part of us, um, you know, that I think we assumed until very recently were really just kind of freeloaders or potentially dangerous. You know, we could not possibly live without them and, you know, nor could any form of life. Every animal, every uh, uh, plant, um, you know, all multicellular life evolved with bacteria, you know, and um, from bacteria. Um, bacteria, are, you know, really are our ancestors and they've been our partners the whole time. Wow. So let's talk about some of this bacteria, Sandor. Like, it's always mentioned like lactobacillus, right? And like when you're culturing, I mean, I, I know you've done all the research. So, I mean, this is the, you're the person to ask this question. Everybody always says lactobacillus, but what <coughs> other kinds of bacteria, beneficial bacteria, are actually on the food? And I know every different food, you know, caters to a different bacteria, and especially during our early part of the ferment, middle or late, there's also different bacteria, because I know like, especially with composting in, in, in a heat environment, at different stages of the, the heat, when you're making compost, there's like thermophilic bacteria, there's this bacteria, and they all work, and depending at what stage, there's more or less. So, I mean, what, what are the different names of some of the bacteria in some of the different, uh, you know, fermented foods? Besides well, the lactobacillus. I mean, you know, okay, so, I, I mean, lactic acid bacteria are much bigger than lactobacillus, and so, um, you know, the lactic acid bacteria that is um, present on all vegetables that generally initiates the fermentation of uh, a, a sauerkraut uh, is, is a genus of bacteria called Leuconostoc. Leuconostoc uh, 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 mesorentoides. <laughs> um, um, and that begins the acidification, and, um, and then eventually those are succeeded by a, a, a lactobacilli. Um, there are other ferments that use bacteria of the um, uh, genus um, uh, Bacillus. Bacillus subtilis is uh, is 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 uh, uh, the primary bacteria in, uh, in 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 some ferments. Um, and there 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 are there are many many others. Um, and of course, it's not only bacteria. I mean, there are also fungi involved in in fermentation. The most famous agent of fermentation is a fungus. That would be yeast, Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Uh, there there are other yeasts. There are even molds that are used by by fermentation. So um, you know, the most familiar one to Western people would be um, cheese molds, like uh, blue cheese molds. All of the soft white cheeses like brie and camembert those are these white powdery molds that grow uh, uh, on the surface and the mycelium is their penetrating or would give that nice soft runny uh, 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 texture um, in, in Asian cuisines um, um, uh, aspergillus molds and rhizopus molds are used aspergillus molds are what are used to make koji which is the starter for making sake and soy sauce and miso and amazon and really many other foods. Um, so, I mean, the range of organisms that are employed by fermentation is, is quite broad. Um, and most traditional fermented foods don't involve one singular organism, but rather these broad communities of organisms. And in the natural world, this is how we find microorganisms, is they're never singular. Uh, isolated microorganisms are, uh, you know, really a human technological invention. Uh, uh, Louis Pasteur first isolated yeast. And so, you know, humans have been making bread for uh, something like 10,000 years, but yeast as a separate thing that you would add to the bread is brand new. It's, uh, you know, from, from the 20th century. So all the bread that was made for the first, you know, 9,900 and some years was made with natural leavening. It's the, it's the yeast along with the bacteria that's found on the flour. 
um, that, that's just present on all grains. But you know, all the products of all agriculture, all of the you know sort of um, um, you know raw um, um, uh, products of agriculture are populated by these elaborate communities of organisms. And you know, um, uh, in the absence of um, um, you know uh, um, <clears throat> very recent uh, technological innovations, you know, all traditional fermented foods involve these broad communities of organisms, and that's one of the things that makes them so powerful. Uh, you know, in terms of probiotics, is that in contrast to your standard probiotic capsule, which is you know a billion copies of one or two or three bacterial strains, most traditional fermented foods like sauerkraut, like yogurt, like kefir, um, you know, they involve these broad communities of organisms, so they're much more biodiverse. Wow, <laughs> that's crazy. Thank you for that information. Hope you guys learn a little bit. Uh, the next question actually has to do with we're going to get into now ferments and things that can be fermented, you know, like some of the things that you grow in your garden that you have extra that you can ferment. So the first question to lead it off since you're kind of talking about it is, uh, you know, uh, uh, do you believe in some of those starter cultures that you could just buy like white powder to add to your vegetables to ferment mm. them? You know, because I know a lot of people are scared of fermentation and they feel if I buy this starter culture, it's going to be safe for sure. Um, I certainly think that you know adding a powdered starter culture is completely unnecessary. Um, you know, generally the the starter cultures that are being marketed for fermenting vegetables are Lactobacillus plantarum, which is what will inevitably develop in a mature sauerkraut after a couple of weeks anyway. Um, a long time ago, in the 1940s, the U.S. sauerkraut industry explored switching to using a Lactobacillus plantarum starter. And the reason why they decided not to was that their taste panels told them that it didn't taste as good. And their analysis was that they lost flavor complexity because sauerkraut is a successional process. And um, you know, as the process proceeds, you get sort of different populations of bacteria coming into dominance and each at each of those stages there are different um, metabolic byproducts and it's the accumulation of these metabolic byproducts that gives sauerkraut its flavor complexity and so if you cut out the early stages and just start with the late stage bacteria um, uh, you know the, the, the flavor can suffer there's no necessity of it for safety reasons because how do you make a food that has no history of food poisoning or illness or danger safer. If it's 100% safer, you're gonna make it 110% safe. Um, I would say that, that, that the um, you know, most useful application in my mind of starters like that is speed. If you're trying to speed things up, if you're in a rush. Um, and really like, you know, for most of history, if you're trying to preserve food, the last thing you wanna do is speed up the process. <laughs> you wanna slow down the process and that's why people have always done it in cellars and uh, you know, cool uh, uh, spaces or relatively cool spaces. Uh, it's to slow down the process. But if you're in a hurry, uh, adding a starter culture will, you know, speed things up um, um, a, a little bit. But there's no, there's no need for those cultures. The bacteria you need are on all the vegetables. The, pro the, the process is intrinsically safe, um, so you don't need to add a special powder to make it safer. Now, on the other hand, I mean, certain foods you can't make without a starter. Um, you know, if you want to make um, tempeh, which is a you know wonderful Indonesian style of uh, soybeans or other beans or beans and grains um, um, that are bound together into a coherent, uh, cohesive uh, mat uh, uh, by the growth of, 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 of fungus, um, you, you kind of need to obtain some spores of the starter, and they're you know easily available on the internet, um, uh, tempeh starter. But I mean, certain things you need a starter for if you want to make yogurt you need a starter I mean the starter could be as simple as a previous batch of yogurt that you're adding into it but you need some source of um, you know the bacteria that, 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 that you want um, uh, to be there so I'm, I'm certainly not you know opposed to the use of starters but I think in, in in certain kinds of things when you're working with raw plant material you know all the organisms you need are are, are there anyway this is um, this is what this is wild fermentation which is the title of my book but I didn't make it up um, you know it's found throughout the literature and, and, and wild fermentation is a phrase that describes fermentation based on the organisms that are just present on the food that you're fermenting or to a limited degree the environment around us. Yeah, it's kind of like the Korean farming technology, IMOs, yeah. right? They're yeah. just using indigenous organisms. Not to say that foreign organisms may also be beneficial because maybe you're 
climate zone doesn't have some other ones that may be beneficial but they're just not there but whole nother topic for another day but uh, Sandra let's get into uh, you know some easy ferments that people could do at home you know I mean in your <laughs> class today that you gave you know you showed uh, three different styles of really easy ferments and basically I mean you didn't even have any tools only tool you had actually was well you had a bowl and you had a mason jar and your hands <laughs> so do you want to explain this right. for the people that weren't there just real quick right well i did have a knife and a All cutting right. board in the room that i prepped in but i <laughs> i did that before I, I i got up on the stage but i i like to keep it simple i mean fermentation is not rocket science and um you know certainly like you know if you're making if you're going to start a small sauerkraut factory you're probably not going <laughs> to chop up your cabbage with a with a knife and a fork you're probably going to get a continuous feed food processor which is very, very wonderful but if you're making a quart of sauerkraut with two pounds of cabbage you don't need to you know buy an expensive food processor the knife is going to work uh, uh, perfectly well um so so i like to keep it simple um you know i use simple vessels i use jars i use simple cylindrical crocs I use barrels I use things like that um, uh, you know in the workshop today we did a, 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 a corn onion and a pear relish we did uh, dilly beans so um, uh, uh, raw uh, green beans uh, uh, in a jar with garlic and dill and then we poured a saltwater brine over it and then we did a beverage you can also make these things as beverages but add higher proportions of water so we made a, a, a an Indian beverage called kanji k-a-a-n-j-i which is uh, uh, carrots I used a little bit of beets as well and mustard seeds cover it with water dechlorinated water don't take water right out of your municipal tap full of chlorine you need to um, uh, either run it through a filter or evaporate off the chlorine or use water from a well or a spring cover it with water and then just a pinch of salt but you know these are just a few techniques um, you know once you get the general concept that to ferment vegetables you need to get them submerged and protect them from the the the, the flow of oxygen then you know, you could do anything. I mean, it's a, it's an incredibly uh, uh, creative if if you um, uh, y you know if if you're an experimental kind of person and you know any kind of vegetable, any kind of seasoning, um, you know you you can ferment it. Um, um, you know, I've had. I mean, it's been a particular pleasure for me seeing what people do. Um, you know, teaching all these workshops and seeing what people show up with is just unusual variations. How about vanilla kraut? This young woman showed up at one of my workshops with a uh, sauerkraut with vanilla beans minced into it, which was delicious. How about mashed potato sauerkraut, where you mash a little bit of potatoes and, and mix that in with your uh, uh, salted cabbage? Um, um, you know, the possibilities really are uh, uh, pretty much infinite. Wow, yeah, I mean, I've fermented many things in my kitchen, you know, okra, green beans, I mean, the standard cabbage, carrots, beets, you know, what about, uh, oh, and uh, I love the peppers, right? The little small mm. hot peppers fermented. But uh, what are some of the things that uh, you enjoy actually at home? Well, I mean, one thing that I did for the first time this year, just because a friend of mine showed up with this big bucket of ramps, is I made ramps sauerkraut, and I took the greens and the um, bulbs, and I just chopped them up. I lightly salted them, uh, squeezed them a little bit to start pulling the juice out of them and get them juicy, and then stuffed them in a jar. And oh my God, those were it was so good. It really it it like had it had like hints of the flavor of. Um, you know, if, you, if I had sauteed those ramps, wow. I mean, it was almost like it cooked it and um, uh, it was so, so delicious and it was a very sad day in my life when, uh, when, when that ran out. <laughs> um, I just made a, I've just made a batch a couple of weeks ago of um, perilla kimchi, Ooh. where I have perilla coming up as a weed Me in my too. garden all yeah. over. So I just took, I harvested a bunch of the larger leaves of perilla. Um, um, I made a batch of uh, sticky rice and then I mixed all the kimchi spices, uh, garlic, ginger, um, 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 uh, I used onions and um, uh, chili pepper in with that uh, sticky rice and then I stuffed them and sort of wrapped each of the um, uh, 
perilla leaves uh, or use the perilla leaf to wrap a little bit of the stuffing and then I watered down some of the stuffing and put it at the bottom and then I layered the the little rolls and then and then put more of the stuffing in between the layers so the whole thing was submerged and um, those have been a, a big hit and really delicious and you know if you can imagine like a, a spicy equivalent of a stuffed grape leaf but you know that's that's you know probiotic and um, you know got all those um, exciting kimchi flavors uh, are, are really wonderful. So I I experiment a lot, and then there's certain things I always do. Like um, uh, in November, um, I'll go to my friend's biodynamic farm and fill up my pickup truck with um, daikon radishes, and um, you know fill up a 55 gallon vessel that I have with. Um, um, you know, daikon radishes and a little bit of cabbage and a little bit of chili pepper and a little bit of garlic and um, and I'll be eating that and sharing that with friends and at workshops uh, all through the winter. Wow, and let, let's get back to that. You, you mentioned like uh, fermentation is a kind of cold cooking actually in uh, your presentation. Do you want to explain that to my viewers? Yeah, sure. So, um, I mean, fermentation breaks down nutrients, um, uh, you know, in, in ways that could be analogous to the way that cooking breaks down nutrients and makes nutrients more available. So, you know, certain foods, um, um, you know, the, the nutrients are barely uh, uh, accessible to us, um, you know, uh, without fermentation. For instance, so soybeans, yeah. you know, the reason why soybeans have gotten so much attention in the Western uh, uh, vegetarian subcultures is that they're considered to be the plant food with the most concentrated protein, but our human, human bodies can't access that protein from a soybean. And so if we just cook soybeans and eat them, you know, they'll make us gassy, give us indigestion, but we're not going to get the, the, the protein out of them. And so, you know, the Asian cultures that pioneered soy agriculture recognized this millennia ago. And, um, you know, through experimentation, happy accidents, who knows, you know, sort of figured out all of these different methods for fermenting the soybeans. So there's soy sauce, there's miso, there's tempeh, there's natto, there's many other variations, um, um, you know, different in their processes, different in the organisms that ferment them, but what they all have in common is that um, the fermentation breaks down the proteins into amino acids, the building blocks of proteins. You know, this is pre-digestion. You know, similarly, the lactose in milk gets broken down by fermentation. Even the gluten in wheat and other grains gets broken down not by yeast, but by bacteria. And it's, you know, sort of only in the 20th century that we had like little packets of yeast that were a separate thing. Natural leavening, what we would today call sourdough, involves yeast along with lactic acid bacteria. So in addition to getting this sort of lift in the dough, you get this pre-digestion that breaks down some of the gluten. Mm, wow. <laughs> yeah, amazing. I don't eat any soy that's not fermented. <laughs> Number one. So anyways, uh, let's move on, Sandor, to uh, talk about salt because I know you know, I was surprised, you know, seeing you in your demonstration today, in your presentation, that, you know, salt, you weren't like measuring it out, you know, just, oh, this, is a, this is enough and this and that. And I know a lot of people get paranoid, like, I got to make sure I have enough salt. It's got to be 3%. It's got to be 5%. Like, you know, do you want to kind of go over, uh, you know, the, how much is salt and actually what types of salt uh, you recommend? Sure. Um, I, I mean, my personal preference is to use unrefined sea salts, but, um, um, you know, don't get too caught up that you need to go buy some special salt. Definitely don't like put off making sauerkraut because you don't have the right kind of salt. Whatever kind of salt you have in your kitchen is really fine. Most of the literature suggests not using iodized table salt, but I can tell you because people who organize workshops have handed me iodized table salt many times, it works fine. Um, there's not enough iodine in the salt to inhibit the fermentation, so don't get too caught up on that. I mean, as far as proportion of salt, fermentation is not rocket science. Like, don't imagine that there's some, like, magic number, some, like, minimum amount of salt that you need in order for the process to, to be safe. In fact, you could make sauerkraut without any salt. It's not going to have a very good texture. It's not going to have a very good flavor. But, uh, you know, it, it won't be dangerous for the lack of salt. Um, um, it'll just be um, sort of, you know, soft and, and, and mushy because the salt does many beneficial things. Um, you know, number one, salt pulls water out of the vegetables and, um, you know, makes it easier to get the vegetables submerged under their own juices. Uh, number two, 
What makes vegetables crispy are pectins and salt hardens pectins. Eventually, vegetables that ferment for a long time, it happens faster with uh, uh, watery summer vegetables like cucumbers and zucchini, but it'll happen to cabbages and radishes as well uh, if you leave them for long enough or in a warm time, is vegetables can get soft and mushy. That's the work of enzymes. Salt slows down those enzymes. Um, salt also slows down the lactic acid bacteria. And, uh, you know, like we said earlier, when you're trying to preserve vegetables, slowing down the process buys you more time. Um, so, you know, if you have ancestors who were making sauerkraut or if you learned how to make sauerkraut from your, you know, grandparents who learned from their grandparents who learned from their grandparents, a lot of the traditional products are very salty because they represented survival. If, you know, these are the last cabbages you're going to see for the next six months, you have a reason to put a lot of salt in. But that doesn't mean that sauerkraut has to be extremely salty. Uh, if you prefer a milder kraut that you're going to ferment in small batches uh, and ferment for, you know, let's say two weeks. To just give an arbitrary amount of time and then eat it and then make another small batch, um, you can use much lower proportions of salt. Um, you know, most of the contemporary commercial kraut makers who I'm meeting are working with a proportion somewhere around one and a half percent salt by weight. Um, but, you know, if we had a batch that was a half a percent, one percent, one and a half, two percent, you know, people wouldn't agree on which one tasted the best. So, I mean, the whole point of making things for yourself is to make them the way you like them. And so what I would recommend is lightly salt the vegetables as you're shredding them, mix them up, and then taste it. And then if you want to add more salt, add more salt. I always like to start light because it's so much easier to add salt than it is to subtract salt. But if you find that you have just way over salted it, it's not impossible to subtract salt. It's just that you can't su subtract only salt. When you take away salt, you also take away other nutrients. So but the way you do that is just cover it with water, let the water sit for a few minutes, stir it, pour off the excess water, taste it again. If necessary, repeat this process until the salt level is, um, um, you know, uh, pleasing to you. Great, great. So another thing I want to talk about is how somebody doesn't need to buy these fancy airlocks and all these things. Like in your presentation today, you're literally just using a mason jar and actually you have a technique where you just off gas it every morning when you're making your coffee. You want to share that with my viewers so that they don't have to feel scared that they have to buy this special crock yeah. pot and all this stuff. Well, I mean, you know, fermentation has always inspired, um, uh, you know, uh, technical innovation. And so, I mean, I, I actually love some of the gadgets that people are, 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 are coming up with, but you don't need a lot of gadgets at all. Like a jar is really totally adequate. A wide mouth jar is a little bit easier to deal with than a narrow neck jar, but a narrow neck jar is not impossible to deal with. So, you know, you can work with, 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 with what you've got. Um, but you have to remember, you know, this, this, that you're cultivating bacteria and this is alive. So you can't just like bury it in the closet and forget about it for six months because it's going to produce carbon dioxide and it's going to build up pressure and that pressure needs to get out of there some way. Uh, with mason jars, your jars will never explode. What will happen is that, that the metal lid will just bend until the air can, and until the pressure can, can get out. What I like to do is leave it right on my kitchen counter, at least for the first week or week and a half, which is when you get the most carbon dioxide. I mean, the process can go on for months, but as the, you know, it's a successional process, as I said earlier, as the bacterial populations shift, there's less carbon dioxide production. So your heaviest production is going to be in the first week or so, and that's when it's most important to off gas and then you'll just start noticing that there's less pressure um, uh, being produced uh, 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 each day and then you could start doing it um, uh, uh, less frequently but there there are um, you know all kinds of um, you know clever uh, uh, crock designs um, um, and gadgets that sort of enable them to automatically off gas and you know many people find that much easier than uh, manually off gassing which is the way I like to do it one of my favorite lazy man tools for making kraut is actually those old fashioned like canning jars that actually have that rubber ring. So mm. I just latch that down and then basically when there's enough pressure, it'll kind of lift it up a little bit yeah. and let some of the gas out. So yeah. then I don't have to do it because I'm, you know, I'm busy in my garden, not paying attention to my ferments. And actually speaking of that, let's segue into the last part of this episode is talking about once your ferment is done, how do you know it's ready? And you know, if you have funky stuff on the top, like some of mine do, it hasn't gone bad. So. Here's a situation, Sandor. I, I made some kraut, I think it probably like after last winter or some, sometime last winter. And I put it in one of those jars and it was like, I, I used, for the liquid I used like a pear or apple juice. And then it was just basically cabbage with some uh, pepper and some salt. 
Mm, uh, sounds great. Yeah, yeah, hot pepper. And I left it in there, and I left it out. <laughs> and then, you know, we got the reactions. It kind of bubbles over, so I put a little plate underneath it so it doesn't, like, drip everywhere. And then I just left it. And then I think, like, over time, I just kind of left it out, forgot about it. And then at some point, I was looking at it, and it had, like, some funky black layer on the top. And then over time, then that later, that black layer, some fuzzy layer, actually ended up disappearing. And now it's gone, and it looks all right. But is, is that kraut now safe to eat? <laughs> well, okay, let me, let me talk about the nature of the, the, the layer that can grow on the top. So, you know, our whole objective in fermenting vegetables is protect them from the flow of oxygen. Mm -hmm. That's why we want to get them submerged. Um, if you just left a, a bowl of loosely shredded cabbage, you know, sitting on the counter, it wouldn't turn into sauerkraut. It would just turn into like a cloud of mold. And that mold could literally reduce your head of cabbage into a puddle of slime that bears no resemblance whatsoever to delicious, tangy, crunchy sauerkraut. Um, so, you know, we're getting the vegetables sub submerged to protect them from oxygen, but, you know, except in the case of, you know, certain vessels that are very cleverly engineered to protect the surface from oxygen, the surface is where it comes into contact with oxygen, and that's where the problems happen. That's where you get these funky surface growths. Uh, generally, you'll get either yeast, a yeast called calm yeast, which is like a beige layer that grows on the top, a little bit wavy, just scrape that off, or otherwise you'll get molds. Generally, the molds that you'll get are white molds, and only if you let them grow for a long time will they start to turn uh, gray and uh, and black. These white molds or molds in that this monochromatic range are generally regarded as safe. Um, I mean, there do exist molds in the world that can be extremely dangerous, like don't eat foods with like orange molds growing on them, red molds growing on them, just throw it away. Um, but that's not what grows on, on, on your fermented vegetables. You get white molds. What I, I've watched people just stir it back in and eat it. Um, you know, my, my, my preference is to skim off the surface as best I can. If any of the vegetables seem like they're discolored or getting soft, I'll skim those off. And once I get to vegetables that are the right color, um, um, then I just eat it and, uh, and enjoy it. And uh, this is what I've been advising people to do. And I have yet to ever hear one story story of anyone who, um, you know, had any kind of a reaction uh, 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 to that. And, um, you know, the, 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 the literature generally confirms that, um, you know, these molds are totally harmless and, um, you know, don't um, ruin uh, 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 the kraut. So don't worry about it too much. In terms of the other question that you asked, how long do you ferment and how do you know when it's ready? This is kind of like the million dollar question of fermentation. Um, and there's no objective answer to the question. Um, uh, you know, in fermented vegetables in, you know, most of the traditional applications, people would make it at the fall, eat it through the winter into the spring. So the total fermentation time might in some places be six months or, or even longer. But that doesn't mean people are waiting for six months before they eat them. Like they're probably waiting a couple of weeks and then starting to, 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 to eat them. Um, a lot of the contemporary books, uh, you know, assume that we require immediate gratification and they say ferment it for three days and then move it to the refrigerator. Um, you know, generally for me, it's somewhere in between the, the, the extremes. So, um, you know, if you've never done it before, what I would say is, you know, give it three or four days and then just taste a little bit of it. Pack it back down, make sure it's submerged again. Give it three or four more days, taste it again. Oh, it'll taste a little bit stronger. The acids accumulate over time. The texture will be different. The flavors will be more melded. Give it a few more days. It'll keep on getting stronger, more acidic, more sour. And then if one day you taste it and you think like, wow, this is strong. I don't want this to get any stronger. Will you have a fermentation slowing device in your kitchen? I would assume if you have a computer to be watching this on, you probably have a refrigerator in your kitchen. That's the time to um, um, uh, uh, move this to the refrigerator. Um, of course, the history of sauerkraut, nobody had a refrigerator. Um, in many parts of the world, people still don't have refrigerators. Um, so you don't need to ever refrigerate it. If you're not going to refrigerate it, just find a cool spot. If you have a, 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 a cellar or a basement that isn't heated, that's a great place. Uh, the refrigerator's fine. May, maybe like a mud room or someplace that's like, um, you know, not fully heated. Um, you know, there's, there, there, there's a lot of possibilities. Um, but, um, but definitely, um, you know, when it's ready is subjective. It's ready when you think it's ready and not when I think it's ready.
Yeah, I mean, I, I say the same thing with when you're growing your vegetables, right? It's ready whenever you want to harvest it. Not like when you buy vegetables at the store, they've dictated to you when you're going to eat it. They've dictated to you when it's ready. And on tomatoes, that's when they're pink and they still bounce, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so anyway, Sandra, back to the question I had. Oops, sorry. Was um, uh, So, okay, so yeah, when I have my bad kraut and it like has funky stuff on the top, generally I'll skim that off and that goes right in my compost because that has good bacteria, who knows what, that's adding to my compost pile that I feel comfortable adding yeah, to my compost yeah. pile, but not into me. And then also when some of the vegetables are discolored at the top, I'm like, oh, these are looking funky. Those come off also and go into my compost. And then normally underneath, I, I eat them and I, they, it usually tastes all right. So, but in the case of this last batch I did, underneath when I started eating them, it just didn't have the crunch anymore. It's like really soft. Is, is that still well, all right? Or how can you really tell if it goes bad or does it really never yeah. go bad as long as you have an acid environment? And if so, if I tested it with the pH paper and I saw it was acid, then I'm like, can I pretty, pretty sure believe that it, it was, it's safe and what's the pH level? Um, well, okay, right, well, I'll answer the pH question first. Um, uh, you know, most of the, um, you know, commercial producers who I meet, like their regulatory authorities mm -hmm. are asking them to test pH and generally the pH they're looking for is 4.6 or lower. And it is, um, you know, generally regarded that at that level of acidity, like none of the organisms that we worry about in terms of food poisoning um, um, can, can grow. So that, that's sort of the, 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 the threshold for safety. But I, you know, on a household level, you, you, there's just no necessity to, to do that, I would say. Um, um, in terms of like, does it eventually go bad? So, I mean, I mentioned earlier that when the vegetables get soft, that's the work of en enzymes. What gives vegetables their Christmas is pectins, and there are pectinase enzymes that digest the pectins. And so, you know, that's aesthetic. I mean, you know, for me, if it gets to a certain level of softness, it goes in the compost because it's not appealing to me anymore. It's not that, I mean, the only reason to reject food isn't that it's going to kill you or make you sick. I mean, it could just be that like, it's not appealing to you anymore. Um, so, especially in summer temperatures, yes. like if it's hot, if you leave it for a long time in a, in a hot space, those pectinase enzymes mm -hmm. really get active, even with, um, you know, cabbages or radishes or vegetables that can generally hold their crunch better. Um, so, um, you know, for longer term fermentation, you want a cool spot. Um, um, and, um, you know, that, that's why a cellar is just so great for, for fermentation. You can ferment for months and months and months in the cellar without vegetables uh, uh, getting soft. But if you're at ambient temperatures, then sometimes it's cool and you could go for a long time and sometimes it's hot and you have to have a, like a shorter time frame that you work with. And, you know, the, the time for preservation isn't like the beginning or the middle of the summer. It's the <laughs> end of the summer. It's when the, when, the, when the temperatures are getting cooler, that's when it's suitable to sort of put food up that's going to get you through the winter. I do shorter term batches all the time. You mentioned okra. I love, I love fermenting okra, but that's not something that I sort of, um, uh, you know, typically will leave for months and months and months. Or if I did, I would eventually leave it in the refrigerator for months and months and months after the shorter fermentation at, you know, the hot temperatures where okra will grow. Same with cucumber pickles. Right, yeah, I mean, I live in the desert, so it's a little bit off because, you know, I can't really grow, you know, cabbages and all this stuff in like 100 plus degree weather. I grow tropical Asian vegetables, and in the wintertime, that's when I grow all the coal crops. I mean, literally coal crops. And then I start pickling them and fermenting them right, right before the summer, which is a little bit odd, but well, I could do it. You know, I just have to, um, you know, moderate it more and put it in the fridge a little bit earlier if I don't want it to get soft. Well, and I mean, I mean, another perspective is that, you know, for someone living in an environment like where you live, um, you know, long-term fermentation just is not as critical or, or as relevant. Of like course. you don't have a long winter without fresh vegetables. <laughs> um, so, um, but in all the places that have a long season where you can't grow anything, you also have cold weather, which makes preservation much easier. So another question I have for you, Sandra, is a personal experience. You know, I made some uh, pickles out of, uh, you know, uh, uh, cucumbers, right? And on the top, if I open it in, because it, it's in the fridge now, it's been in the fridge for a while, um, you know, there's all this like white fuzzy stuff on the top. So could I just skim that off and then cut off some of the cucumbers that are sticking above water and then I'd be fine? Exactly. All right, that was easy. And then the other thing I wanted to say is that, you know, if you get a ferment that's not to your desired texture, like, right, some of the, the pectin and the firmness crunchiness gets lost, right? I've had places that will actually just take those vegetables that are fermented and then dehydrate them. So then they'll bring the crunch back and then you also get to keep the probiotics 
that are in the foods, you know, and you could use them at a later time. The other thing I like to do with those things that I've gotten too soft that I don't like the flavor too much is I'll just take a handful and put it in my blended in my blender for a blended salad, a blended soup for flavoring or for a dressing. So, Sandra, real quick, what's some uh, ways you like to use some uh, ferments in in food in in, prep, in food <clears throat> preparation besides just eating it straight? Well, I'm, I mean, let me let me just sort of um, um, echo what, what what you said. I mean, I, I think dehydrating is a great way of sort of salvaging vegetables that got soft and, and mushy. Also, if you mix them with uh, maybe flax or, mm. or 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 grains, you can make wonderful crackers yeah. that have the 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 the, the flavor of. Um, uh, uh, the fermented vegetables and the probiotics if you just do a low temperature uh, a dehydration of them. Um, I just met somebody a couple months ago who's doing salts, who's taking excess brine and dehydrating that and then marketing little jars of these flavored fermented salts that were so, okay. so delicious. Um, I've become a big fan of kimchi soup. Mm. Um, and oh my god, I, I mean, I just like, I love, um, I, I love the flavors of kimchi in a, a hot soup, mm. um, you know, with a little bit of tofu and a little bit of bacon in it mm -hmm. and beautiful spicy flavor. Um, um, uh, I, I really love that. Um, I love to do, um, I, I, I've, I've gotten into doing, um, fermenting whole heads of cabbage. Sometimes I'll just bury one head in um, a crock of shredded sauerkraut. Um, and then I love to use those leaves, which are pliable, to make various kinds of stuffed cabbages. Sometimes little raw stuffed uh, uh, rolls. Sometimes I'll cook them, um, you know, with uh, meat and grains in them um, uh, and make like, you know, sarma. Um, but, um, you know, I think it's really important to eat some of the fermented vegetables raw, but that doesn't mean you can never cook them. Um, um, you know, if you make a lot of them, cook some of it, uh, uh, eat some of it raw. You know, the, 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 the cuisines uh, uh, that feature fermented vegetables hev uh, heavily use them uh, 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 in their cooking as well as uh, uh, eating them raw. Yeah, get them any way you guys can, but you know, of course I try to eat as many of them as I can just in their raw natural state because I really want to get the probiotics out of them. I've heard so many testimonials from people by just literally eating some fermented foods, you know, has helped their digestion. I mean, it actually, that's something that's helped my mom personally and as well as me. Anyways, we're running out of time today. And so one of the last questions I have for you today, uh, Sandor, is uh, are there any words of wisdom you would like to share with my viewers today uh, at the end of this video right now? Well, I mean, since, since, since you're doing, um, you know, primarily a show about gardening, I mean, I, I guess I just want to sort of reiterate that, like, you know, for me, my, my, my exploration of fermentation literally grew out of the garden and trying to, you know, sort of figure out what to do with, um, um, you know, the, the fleeting excesses of, uh, of, of the gardening season. And I think this is the nature of agriculture. Agriculture never produces like an even flow of food throughout the year. You get these periods of where there's more than you know what to do with, and these periods where there's not so much growing. And, um, you know, I would just leave you with the idea that agriculture would not really be possible without fermentation. If we didn't have effective strategies to preserve the, 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 the harvest, um, um, you know, then, then, then the cycles of agricultural food uh, um, availability, um, um, you know, couldn't really sustain us. So, so fermentation is a really critical piece of, of, of the garden, not only in compost and, and, and soil fertility, but also in how people can make effective use of the food resources that they have. And, um, and like the garden, there's no one way to do it. Um, you know, there's lots of different ideas about how to do it. People have, can have good results with very different kinds of uh, uh, approaches to it. Um, but, you know, don't be afraid to experiment and, um, you know, don't, de don't be intimidated. This definitely is not rocket science. And uh, thank you so much for your interest, John. Oh yeah, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I just basically, what he said was genius. Like, <laughs> it, it, I don't know, it, I just, uh, so amazing that, you know, uh, you know, your garden could be the spark for you guys. And I mean, fermentation has been used for literally thousands of years. And it's like an old school tradition that we've, we've lost. And Sandor has done so much research and looking into and, and learning about some of the traditional ways it's used 
And that's actually in his book, The Art of Fermentation, that I mentioned earlier. So I'll put links down below to his books uh, on Amazon. And I would encourage you guys to get those, to get more into fermentation, especially if you guys are into gardening, to put up your food, to save it in one of the best ways and traditional ways that has been used. So Sandra, if somebody wants to learn more about you and your work, uh, do you have websites and links you want to uh, share with everybody? Sure. My website is wildfermentation.com. And you can find out about my books. You can find out about workshops that I'm teaching, sometimes where I live in Tennessee and I do a lot of traveling and teach in other places. Um, uh, and I also have links to all kinds of fermentation related resources that are out there on the World Wide Web. So yeah, check out my website, wildfermentation.com. And my two books are Wild Fermentation and The Art of Fermentation. Mm. Yeah, and I recommend those highly, just on a personal level. <laughs> so, Sweet, um, yeah, thank so you. thank you, Sandor, for taking time out of your busy schedule because now he has to just, she has a gun run to the airport and to fly out of here. So, yeah, thanks for uh, being on my show. Right. I appreciate it so much. Great. And uh, for you guys watching out at home, if you guys enjoyed this episode with Sandor, want me to do more videos with him in the future, please be sure to give this a video a thumbs up. If I got a lot of thumbs up, maybe I'll even get out to Tennessee and visit him and right, uh, show with you guys great. more about what he's doing and make some more, de more detailed uh, videos about fermentation and all this kind of stuff. It is so easy and I want you guys to start today. You know, no excuse for not fermenting. You know, it's virtually impossible to mess it up. If you get some fuzzy stuff on the top, don't worry, like they say in New York, don't worry about it. Wait, you could say it in New York. I can't say it. Yeah. Scoop the stuff off, put in your compost, and uh, eat the stuff down below. You're good to go. <laughs> also, be sure to click that subscribe button right down below so you don't miss out on any of my new and upcoming episodes. You never know where I'll show up or what you'll be learning on my YouTube channel. I have videos coming out every three to four days. Also, be sure to check my past episodes. My past episodes are a wealth of knowledge. Over 1,300 episodes at this time. Teach you guys all aspects on growing and also, in this case, preserving your food at home. And be sure to share this video with somebody else you know that gardens, grows foods, and should you know get some uh, very imp imp informational or very important information about fermentation. So uh, with that, my name is John Kohler with GrowingYourGreens.com. We'll see you next time. And until then, remember, keep on growing.